Welcome back to the adventures of the madman with the blue box that's bigger on the inside. Today, we begin our look at the Patrick Troughton era of Doctor Who. And we start with a lost serial that, thanks to the power of animation, has come back from the dead. The power of the Daleks. The Doctor, uh, uh, Ben and Polly, the two newest members of Team TARDIS, land on a colony that is riddled with strife. Nobody is cooperating, and everyone's trying to undermine one another. When suddenly they find a strange capsule that's been buried for who knows how long, and what do you know, it contains Daleks. Eventually, the Daleks end up being awakened by a well-meaning but obviously in the wrong scientist, and chaos ensues. Luckily, the Doctor manages to save the day, although we, uh, we get a look at a character that is very, very new, you see. Patrick Troughton is the space hobo version of the Doctor. He plays at being a buffoon, but once in a while he becomes a dark chess master, which is ironic because that is the seventh Doctor's primary persona. So, there you go. Also, the story takes place on the planet Vulcan. No, not the one from Star Trek. It was named Vulcan slightly before the Star Trek Vulcan. Also, it is, it is mostly mercury swamps, so no wonder it's named Vulcan. <laughs> <clears throat> Next adventure, Team TARDIS lands in Scotland during the Jacobite Rebellion of the mid-1740s. And before you ask, yes, the series Outlander was partially inspired by this episode. In fact, the character of Jamie Fraser was... A direct Doctor Who reference. Speaking of Jamie, uh, when the Doctor and his friends uncover a plot by the British, well, one British officer, to sell captured Scots into slavery, well, not really slavery so much as endangered servitude as uh, option against being hung, <clears throat> they meet young Scottish Highlander Jamie McCrimmon. Now, he has his Scottish-isms, and yes, he's a little behind the times, but he's fairly quick on the uptake when it comes to understanding the Doctor's world. And he's very brave and loyal, strong, despite being little. It's always a little guy you gotta watch out for. <laughs> um, ultimately, he helps Team TARDIS thwart this uh, rogue British officer and save the day. This episode is lost, but hopefully it'll someday be uh, restored. There are a few very, very violent censor clips on the Lost in Time DVD, so you can check out part of it there. Hopefully it'll be restored someday. <clears throat> Also, we get to see one of the second Doctor's sort of dead-end aspects. He's a master of disguise. That's one of the sad points of the fact that this episode is lost. Well, this serial is lost. We don't get to see the Doctor's disguises. However, in the next adventure, we do. Unfortunately, it's less impressive... Yes, we have come to 
the underwater menace. Team TARDIS, now consisting of the Doctor, Jamie, Ben, and Polly, land in what remains of Atlantis. I kid you not. They find out that there are still people living in Atlantis, albeit they're sacrificing shipwreck victims to sharks. Well, not sharks. A uh, deity named Amdo, but the sharks are like her instrument or whatever. Oh, and the guy who does the sacrificing... He's actually the same guy who played uh, one of the antagonists in The Celestial Toymaker. The one with the childlike voice. And yet he's a sort of a heavy set guy. Yeah, same guy. Anywho, they meet up with a guy named Zaroff, who says he can raise Atlantis, but. What he doesn't tell the Atlanteans is he's going to raise it by blowing up the Earth. Yeah. Uh, originally, his character was supposed to be driven mad with grief over the fact that he lost his wife and kids in a car wreck. And that idea gets completely scrapped. Basically, he wants to wield supreme power as a scientist. So instead of a tragic character, we get... Yeah. <laughs> so obviously the Doctor has to thwart the plans of this psychopath and also avoid having his companions get turned into fish people with plastic gills. Now, for some reason, the Atlanteans don't try to make those gills internal so people can walk on dry land and then go in the water whenever they feel like it. That's what I would have done, but yeah. Um, for a while, only one of these episodes existed until someone found another one, and they decided to use a telesnap reconstruction for the remaining missing episodes. And just leave it at that because no one really cared about this episode. But that's a real shame. I mean, the final sequence with the um, partial destruction of the lower levels of Atlantis and the thwarting of the Mad Doctor or Mad Professor, that was a sequence that deserved to be seen. All we get are stills. Who knows? Maybe someday they'll rethink uh, the idea of not animating this, or they might find another episode. Who knows? Who knows? Anyway, on to our next adventure. The moon base, where <clears throat> after trying to land on Mars, the Doctor and company land on the moon due to a gravitron beam coming from a weather control station that is using the beam to control the tides which control the weather and science is crying in pain because it's been thrown out the window but just for the sake of entertainment value we'll go with it <clears throat> so things seem okay you know it's an international cast a lot of doohickeys and whatchamacallits and then the Cybermen show up they want to destroy all life on Earth because they feel the need to do that out of self-preservation. When really, they just want revenge for the Doctor's destruction of their homeworld. Although, they really had it coming. Also, we see their first upgrade. They're more metallic, more robot-like, and their voices are no longer even remotely human sounding. Also, they've ditched their, um, uh, what you call, handheld heat beams for uh, stun zappers in their hands. And more miniature gun-like uh, heat weapons that they can holster, like a six-shooter. They can also not temporarily, but partially, take over human bodies with the use of uh, microscopic organisms in 
uh, foodstuffs. So we see the first ideas of cyber conversion, and it's very, very disturbing. Also, <clears throat> um, we see how the doctor can manipulate people, even more so than with the Dalek story. <clears throat> but ultimately, he thwarts the Cybermen, and yeah, that's about it. Oh, also, the spacesuits, while, yeah, looking silly, they are technically on the nose. I mean, yeah, they got some of the materials and specs wrong, but overall, I like the design of the spacesuits, and I do like the Mark II Cybermen, although I like the Mark I Cybermen better. Next, we come to another lost classic resurrected through animation, the Macra Terror. The team lands on uh, another colony that, while seemingly utopian, has this feel or of Orwellian sinisterness. And in order to... Uh, avoid them finding the uh, sinister underbelly. The de facto leader of the colony, Pilot, insert religious joke here, has them fed subliminal messages in their sleep. But Ben's the only one weak-minded enough to fall for it, and he technically becomes an enemy for a while, but thankfully snaps out of it due to circumstances. Ultimately, um, <clears throat> the team finds out that the colony has been taken over by giant sapient crabs called Macra. And it, they're forcing the human, well, not forcing, but coercing the humans to mine a gas from below the planet's surface, which is deadly to humans, but basically like oxygen to the Macra. Or possibly food. And, ultimately, the Doctor manages to convince the leader of the colony to uh, let him destroy the Macra. And they barely succeed in time to survive. Ultimately, uh, being elected leaders of the community, but having none of it, so they decide to leave post-haste because that place, while less creepy now that the macro are gone, is still kind of creepy. Honestly, I felt sorry for the macro. I mean, they were sapient beings who were probably acting out of fear. I mean, humans eat crab meat for dinner, and I'm one of them. I've eaten crab meat. It's very good. It's very sweet. And... I'm betting there are some humans out there who wouldn't care that those crabs were sapient. In fact, SF Debris did a, a, a melted butter and big mallet joke in his review. So, there you go. That's probably why the Macra were, were enslaving humans. They were terrified of becoming dinner. Or at the very least being hunted because they don't stand up to humanity's idea of sapient life. Which is kind of sad. Personally, I would have tried to establish a rapport with the Macra. Maybe pull out the Bill Pullman peace speech from Independence Day. <clears throat> but, unfortunately, that didn't happen. On to the next adventure. He said, on to the next adventure. Team TARDIS lands back in present day, specifically the day Bill, not Bill, um, Ben and Polly left. Unfortunately, they've stumbled into an invasion of the Body Snatchers uh, situation. These faceless aliens who somehow 
lost their identity in a disaster, are taking young people via a phony airline with planes that turn into rockets and uh, machines that turn humans into dolls. Basically, it's like some sort of sciencey version of sympathetic magic. If the doll or a wrist thingy that is on the shapeshifters is messed with, the shapeshifters liquefy. Ew. Uh, Polly is actually turned, and um, the doctor, Jamie, and Ben have to sort things out on their own for a while. Luckily, the doctor prevails. Now, uh, unfortunately, this is sort of half gone. There's episode one and episode three, minus, I think, about 20 seconds of footage. And I guess that was enough to decide to animate the whole thing, because The Faceless Ones is a serial which is going to be animated and released on DVD. And I look forward to that. Um... But this is also a bittersweet serial because it's the last episode, or last uh, serial with Ben and Polly. They decide to stay because they're basically home. And after a quick goodbye, uh, um, the Doctor and Jamie leave to go off in the TARDIS again, but it's been stolen. Dun dun dun. But by whom? Turns out, the Daleks. <clears throat> At first, the Doctor and Jamie chase the TARDIS and end up getting slipped secret messages. And this leads them to an antique shop with very, very new looking antiques. Turns out, it's the backroom operation of an amateur time traveler who, along with his compatriot, was trying to figure out how to explore time, but accidentally uh, pulled the Daleks into uh, Victorian-era Earth. Yeah. Talk about a screw-up. The Daleks take uh, this novice traveler's daughter hostage in order to get him to go after the Doctor. And ultimately the Doctor is coerced into making Jamie play a sick game in order to gain what the Daleks call the human factor, which they believe will help them finally conquer humans. The Doctor, for now, goes along with it, um, which sort of ticks off Jamie. I mean, He's seen the Doctor manipulate people, and it's starting to wear on his nerves. To the point where he probably wants to stop helping the Doctor. Um, ultimately, the human factor is downloaded into three blank Daleks, who are actually kind of... Oh, <laughs> actually kind of cool, is what I was trying to say. This is where my tongue stops working. And... In the human factor is the notion of questioning authority, which is what the doctor was counting on. He wants the human factor to be seeded into the Daleks, so maybe they'll either evolve into better creatures or maybe just have a civil war. But the doctor was hoodwinked. The Dalek Emperor, this big guy right here, that guy, who makes an appearance in the modern series, actually, but for now, he's tricked the Doctor into also creating the Dalek Factor, which the Emperor wants to be put in humans. He's the one who has the TARDIS, and he wants the Doctor to spread the Factor throughout the universe, well, throughout Earth's timeline, at least. But the Doctor manages to 
thwart the Daleks one more time because he's made to go through the machine to get the Dalek factor inputted into him, but it only works on humans, and he's not human. So, he pretends to insist that, or he pretends to be a Dalek and insists that the uh, human Daleks go through the archway in order to get the Dalek factor put back into him. And that fails miserably. More and more Daleks become human, start to question the Emperor's authority. That sparks a civil war. Everything goes sideways. And I really, really hope they animate this episode, or this uh, serial, soon, because I want to see the Dalek Civil War. I've seen Daleks versus those spherical creatures. I've seen Daleks versus Cybermen. I want to see Daleks versus Daleks in the classic series. Um, unfortunately, there are casuals along, or casualties along the way. The novice time traveler, his cohort, who really just wanted to turn base metal into gold, which the Daleks promised him, and then uh, screwed him over. Uh, a young servant named... Um, well, I forget his name. I'm sorry. I'm terrible with names. But the servant guy who um, was meant to fight Jamie, but ultimately became his friend because Jamie showed him mercy, he died too. And so many Daleks died. Um, and the time traveler's house got blown up by a bomb because some days you just can't get rid of a bomb. So basically... Team TARDIS just ended up uh, getting in in way over their heads, and the Doctor once again showed his dark chess master side. And they, the Doctor, Jamie, and newcomer Victoria, the daughter of the uh, novice time traveler, barely escape with their lives. And this closes the book on the Daleks for five years. <clears throat> when next we see the Doctor and company, he goes through a gambit of rogues from his rogues gallery. Until then, this is Mr. J signing out and reminding you, recorders are cool, respect the Brigadier, and never underestimate a Highlander.